I wrote the book The Infection Game, which is coming out in September 2018, because I want to give people the tools that they need, the rules of the game and the tools of the trade, so that they can cure themselves. Because modern medicine and doctoring is not asking the question why. Not only is it not explaining why we're getting these problems, it's not giving people the tools they need to sort these things out themselves, but so much medicine is about symptom suppression with medication. And that, to my mind, is dangerous medicine. We have symptoms for very good reasons. Symptoms protect us from ourselves. For example, if we didn't suffer the symptom of fatigue, we would work all day, all night, all day, all night, and nobody would live more than 11 days. Why? Because nobody has survived more than 11 days without sleep. Sleep is an absolute essential part of being well. We shouldn't be using anti-inflammatory drugs. We have inflammation for very good reason. So the fundamental point here is that as I get older, my medicine gets more simple. And what I find is that the basic things done really well get you an awful long way. And the basic approach to treating everything addresses both sides of the equation. It addresses the energy delivery mechanisms, which are also an important part of fighting infection. And it also addresses the interventions which reduce the infectious load directly. So, for example, the ketogenic diet multitasks. The engine of our car, mitochondria, loves to run on ketones. We know that by putting endurance athletes on a ketogenic diet, we can improve their performance by between 7 and 15%. Uh, the world record for running the furthest distance in 24 hours is held by Mike, Mike Morton. He's an athlete who runs on ketones, and in 24 hours, he ran 172 miles. So he obviously has a very good engine to his car, and he's fueling it with the perfect fuel, which are ketones. But on the other side of the equation, ketones are starving microbes. Microbes can't run on fat. How do I know that? I can keep a bottle of olive oil in my kitchen for months, and it doesn't go off. I can keep a lump of lard in my fridge for, for months, and it doesn't ferment. Whereas if I leave carbohydrates lying around, then they go rotten very quickly. So microbes cannot run on fat. So the ketogenic diet is absolutely crucial for both sides of this equation. Thyroid function. I could talk all day about the thyroid, but the thyroid is the accelerator pedal of our car. And the thyroid gland determines how fast that engine goes. Now, another very useful clinical tool has to do with core temperature. Now, guess what? If we run cold, microbes flourish. If we run a fever, that kills microbes. So keeping our body temperature just right is a really important part of being well. And a very useful clinical tool has to do with core temperatures. Why do I like that? Because anybody can do that. We can all measure our temperature. It's a very easy uh, clinical test. And the point here is that just like you know, keeping your car warm, the car being warm, the car heater working is dependent on the right fuel in the tank, uh, the mitochondrial engine, the thyroid accelerator pedal, and the adrenal gearbox. Now the interesting thing here is if we assume, and I know I'm making an assumption, that patient is eating a good ketogenic diet and their mitochondria working well, and we know from clinical experience mitochondrial function can be corrected quite easily with the correct supplements and the correct detox regimes. It's not, then you don't need expensive tests, you can do this yourself. What that leaves us is with the thyroid accelerator pedal and the adrenal gearbox. Now, if we measure our core temperatures, we can get two easy bits of data from that. First of all, we can get the average core temperature, and the average temperature is a reflection of the thyroid function. And then we can see by how much the temperature fluctuates. And if it wobbles greatly, if it fluctuates by more than, say, half a degree over uh, a day or two, then that is a, a symptomatic of adrenal function. Again, let's ask ourselves about the evolutionary basis for this. Because from an evolutionary perspective, it's very important to exactly match energy delivery to energy demand. So if you're going to survive a cold winter, you don't want to be burning energy unnecessarily because you waste fuel and you risk starving to death. On the other side of that, if you're a primitive man trotting through the jungle and a saber-toothed tiger leaps out at you, you want massive energy delivery mechanisms so you can run the fastest mile you've ever done ever in your life to escape. So 
That matching is key and that is done by the thyroid glands and the adrenal glands combined. It's like a car, the accelerator pedal and the gearbox. You're using them all the time to get the optimum energy delivery from that engine. So by that simple test, it gives a very good handle on, a, on thyroid function and it gives a very good handle on adrenal function. And the joy of this is that can be corrected quite easily using glandulars. And um, now anybody can get thyroid glandulars um, online, anybody can get adrenal glandulars online, and they can uh, use those, maybe with the help of a, a nutritional therapist, to adjust that level of things. But remember, just being cold puts you at risk of infection. And hypothyroidism is very common. And so often I see it in my chronic fatigues and my ME patients, they're running a core temperature of 35.5 degrees centigrade or maybe 36. They're a good degree or maybe two degrees colder than they should be. And that alone will put them at risk of infection. Yeah. Guess what my mum used to say when I was a little girl, when it was cold in the winter? Wrap up, darling, keep warm or you'll catch your death of cold. Why did she say that? Because that's what was observed. Yeah, everybody saw people going out, getting cold, getting pneumonia and dying. It was a common cause of death. And of course, that's why we run a fever. Now, children, of course, are very good at running fevers. Um, and that is a very good way of uh, treating a child who has measles or has chicken pox or has mumps. That's what we should be allowing them to do. We should let them run a fever, get rid of the infection efficiently and be well. But what are they told by the doctors? Oh, mustn't run a fever. Give them paracetamol, give them aspirin, bring that fever down. But that is blocking the very mechanisms that we should be employing to allow the body to get rid of that infection, whatever it may be. I say, nature has all the answers. Don't interfere with those answers with artificial drugs, which might bring short-term comfort, might make the patient feel better in the short term, but in the long term, risks those infections of becoming chronic because they're anti-inflammatory drugs, they reduce the immune response, and that, to my mind, is playing with fire.